I think we're going live. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Better Reading. Hi, everyone at home. It's Cheryl Arkell. Welcome to Better Reading. Um, tonight, I'm in conversation with the wonderful Diane Armstrong. Um, Diane is in Sydney, uh, and so am I. Uh, Diane, you might need to lift your camera up a little bit. I think it's moved slightly. It Just, oh, there we go. That's perfect. So we can see your face. No, oh, the there you go. That's better. Okay, we got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah, we got you. So welcome, welcome, Cheryl Arkell. I'm talking to Diane Armstrong, who um, has a new book, and it's called The Wild Date Palm. Uh, Diane, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. So for all of our people at home, hello, everyone. Um, I've been away, um, as you probably all know. Um, I've been away. I've been in San Francisco for three months. I'm back. So this is my first in conversation, Diane, since I got back. I'm deeply honoured. Yeah, there you go. Now, you, Diane's been writing for a while now, um, haven't you? And you were a yeah. journalist at one stage. You've written yeah. short stories. You've written books. Uh, most famously, Mosaic. Is that right? Well, that yes, was one. My of family, yeah, my family memoir. Right, called Mosaic. We're going to put that up on the screen as well. Hi, everybody at home. Um, I am in conversation with Diane Armstrong, and we're here to talk about her new book. It's called The Wild Date Palm. All right, Diane. Um, would you like to tell us about the book? The Wild Date Palm is a story that when I, it's based on a true story, which when I first heard about it, it absolutely blew me away. I thought there's no way you could invent a story like this. It's got everything in it. It's got passion, espionage, um, the duplicity of governments, a strong heroine who risks everything, sacrifice people who give up everything for an ideal. It's, it just blew me away. It was such a amazing story and it was just one of those stories that for a writer it sort of taps you on the shoulder and says this is a story that absolutely must be told mm. it's okay off. okay all right we're going to hear more about that um for everyone at home it's cheryl arkel i'm in conversation with diane armstrong if you have if you'd like to ask diane any questions if you'd like to ask me any questions please feel free to, to do so. Um, now, in, it's interesting, Diane, I want to tap on um, the idea of you being tapped on the shoulder to tell a story. And I think for a writer, that's that's something, that's, a, that's an experience that they have regularly. Can you go into a bit more depth and tell us? Because for us, the mere mortals, the mere readers <laughs> on this earth, um, <laughs> we probably don't know what that looks like and what that feels like. Talk to me about that. Well, it's just like a shiver that runs down your spine and tells you that, yes, this is a story that is so important and so amazing that I'm just going to have to drop everything and write it. Mm. That's the best, the closest I can come. Look, I just think the whole act of writing, producing a book, is so mysterious and almost magical. Like I start off with a, an idea, I hear a story, I get obsessed by it, and then I sit down and start writing. And somehow, by some form of magical osmosis, 18 months, two years later, it's a book. Now, mm. to me, e even though I've written it, I look at it and I think, how did this all come about? But mm -hmm. I think I, th I really think that there's something about the subconscious mind that mm -hmm. dredges up all these things that you're not even consciously aware of as you're writing, and then it's finished. Mm. Uh, what book number is this? Mm -hmm. Where are you at? Number eight. Number eight. So do your stories sometimes overlap in your head? Is, or is it that you're thinking, you know, this is the story, the wild date palm is the story I'm writing at the moment and whatever's coming um, in the future or whatever's happened in the past is not what you're thinking, is not what you're writing or have you got a lot going on as you're writing the one story? 
when I'm writing the one story, that's the story that is in my mind. I don't then think about any other stories, past, present or future, other than that one. That is mm -hmm. the one I'm totally um, concentrating on and that's, that's it. Mm. Mm. <coughs> okay, I want to talk about how, how it is you came to writing. Um, you, you've started off as a journalist, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And so that's very, it's short form writing in a way, isn't it? Um, and to be a journalist, I think, well, from what I can gather, is that it's great practice um, in terms of writing, but it's a completely different skill, isn't it, to be writing, you know, 500 words, 1,000 words ver versus 90,000 words. So talk to me about when you first made that tr transition from being a journalist to being a writer. Right. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because... That's something I am consciously aware of. Yeah. When I decided to write my family history mosaic, I knew that I would have to abandon journalism and start writing a book. And then I thought, what do I know about writing books? Zilch, nothing. Mm -hmm. And that was quite frightening. And then I talked to myself and I thought, okay, I don't know anything about writing a book, but I do know about writing articles. So I decided that I would treat every chapter as an article. Mm -hmm. And that made it Yeah. Possible. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, that made it sort of manageable. I could do that. And that's how I sort of managed to talk myself into writing a book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I want to talk about, like, inspiration that you get because um, – really pretty much you're writing historical fiction but there's an element of truth to every story that you write about is that right it doesn't come from something that has happened in the past absolutely all my books are based on a person that i've met or a story that i heard or a place where i have been and the whole it it's a difficult issue to turn fact into fiction for the simple reason that the difference between fact and fiction is that fiction has to make sense, right? So I'm looking because at... Because fact often doesn't. Absolutely. Real life yeah. doesn't, right? No. So yeah. with the wild date palm, I'm reading about these extraordinary things that really happened. And in a way, what I'm conscious of doing is making the unbelievable believable because if someone's reading fiction, it's very easy to dismiss it and say, oh, that could never happen. That's unbelievable. So I'm really aware of that. And so when I'm trying to write something that happened in real life, I'm very much aware that I have to make it very personal and very credible because that's the challenge. And also you're bringing to life, really, characters that had a truth to them and now you're you're kind of bringing them to life and adding a fiction element to it. With this story, it's um, based on a true story of siblings. Can you elaborate a little bit about that and how did you find the story? Okay, well, I'll start with how I found it. Um, yeah. I was doing a lot of travel writing and one of my trips took me to Israel some years ago and I was on a tour and on that tour the tour guide sort of casually pointed out of the window and she said oh that's a little town called Zichron Yaakov over there and that's where the remarkable Aronson family came from and they spied on the Turks because they wanted to help Britain win the war this is World War One and I thought that's an interesting story. As soon as I got home, I thought, okay, I'd better find out something about this. I started reading about it. And the more I read, the more unbelievable it was that in this little backwater in the Ottoman Empire in 1917, a group of young people decided that they would form a spy ring and that at the risk of their lives, they spied on the Turks because they could see, they had heard and 
one of them had witnessed part of the Armenian genocide. And that was like a, a wake-up call for her because she could see that the Turks who were already oppressing the Jewish communities in that part of the Ottoman Empire, she could see they were getting more and more oppressive. And so she thought, well, today the Armenians will be next. So she decided that the best solution for them would be for Britain to win the war. And to do that, they decided that they would hand over intelligence to the British that they had obtained secretly through their spy ring. Mm -hmm. So as I read all this, I thought this is really incredible. What's even more amazing is that the young people involved in this espionage ring was a, a sister whom I've called Shoshana, her brother who I've called Nathan, and a younger sister called Leah who really at that point wasn't involved in espionage at all. And Nathan was actually a world famous botanist. He had discovered the origin of the true, the, the wild wheat. And he had traveled to America. He'd been offered a professorship at a leading Californian university. And he had an illustrious career. And he gave all that up to help his sister Shoshana and her lover, Eli, to spy on the Turks. So I thought, well, this is really amazing. But to just to complicate things a bit more, Shoshana and her younger sister were both in love with the same man, the charismatic Eli. Mm -hmm. So thereby hangs another tale, and that complicated everybody's lives no end. So I could see these people, and I didn't really have any trouble creating their relationships on the page and their conversations and their conflicts, it somehow, it just flowed. Mm. Okay, um, for those of you at home, um, Cheryl Arkell, I'm in conversation with the lovely Diane Armstrong. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Diane, if you have some questions for me, if you've read um, the Diane's book, let me know. If you've read Mosaic, let me know. Um, okay, I wanna talk to you about research. When you've got, so you've got this thread of an idea that you've picked up and now you've got to really dig deep, right, and you've got to find out how, you know, what the facts are and how you're going to fictionalise it. But before you start doing that, do you have to fill your head with the complete knowledge in terms of research? Like does that, is that a process that you do, like it's say part one and then you write or are you researching as you're writing? I research first. I feel I couldn't possibly start writing until I knew and, and enough in my enough to start writing, in, enough to create some depth in the subject. And so I do a lot of research. In fact, the research takes as long as it, the writing does. And I have to confess that in some ways the research is the best part because mm -hmm. you find out such interesting facts you follow them up they lead to more interesting facts and it, it, it's a fascinating process but then you've got to sit down and start making sense of it all and constructing a plot and that's when you, the hard work starts but I always research first sometimes while I'm writing I might think oh like for instance when I was writing the wild date palm there's a section where their means of delivering intelligence to the British is, not, is very difficult and the ship doesn't come, there's not many moonless nights, all sorts of complications that risk their lives even more. So they resort to something that's been used for millennia, pigeon, ca carrier pigeons. Now, what did I know about carrier pigeons? Nothing. But as soon as I discovered they play a part, a very important part, you could say even a crucial part in a way in the story, I thought, okay, I'd better find out about carrier pigeons. So that led me down another rabbit hole of information and it was fascinating. And mm -hmm. uh, But I couldn't possibly have thought of writing about it if I hadn't really understood everything that carrier pigeons involved. Mm. Does sometimes your research, like you've got this idea in your head, 
and for a story. So you know what you're going to write about. You're aware of um, uh, these siblings. You do the research. Does that sometimes you discover in your research something that you thought, oh, gosh, that's not what I thought they were doing or you discover something about them that maybe you like or you don't like? And you take that out of the story. Do you, does that? Does the research? What I'm trying to say is, does the research affect the the fictional story that you have in your head? Yes, it does because it provides its structure. Yeah. So yeah, it's the it provides some of the characters. I invented some of the characters, mm. but a lot of the characters are based on real people, and mm. so I I invented the relationships, I invented the conflicts, and I was very happy when I discovered in my research that Lawrence of Arabia was a character that I could put in the book. Now, this mm. has been someone that I've been fascinated by for many years because he's so enigmatic and so um, self-assured and, and so arrogant and so such a difficult, different character. And then I discovered through my research that he actually had met the brother, Nathan, who I call him Nathan in the book. And so and it turns out that Lawrence of Arabia used to, early in his career, he used to travel up and down the coast um, sketching crusader castles. And there's an amazing crusader castle near the town where this family lived. And so that made me think, well, while he was sketching his crusader castle, Shoshana could have ridden past on her horse, which she often did. And so that led to a whole scene, which I invented. But the thing about Lawrence of Arabia is that his famous book, The Pillars, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, is actually dedicated to a mysterious S.A. And he never, ever divulged who S.A. was. And the jury is still out on whether it was actually Shoshana. Well, I'd like to think it was. Mm. And he couldn't divulge it for the reason that they were spies. Well, this was earlier on when he oh, met okay. That was earlier on. But he actually did know that, that they were spying because later on, and this is based on truth, he worked for military intelligence in Cairo, British military intelligence in Cairo. And he was in touch with... Shoshana's brother, who was who then came to Cairo, when the British finally um, agreed to accept the intelligence that this group offered, they realised its value and they moved him to Cairo. And he used to occasionally meet with Lawrence and they were both very similar, which was very interesting. They were both very arrogant, both didn't fit in anywhere, both not really liked by their peers and occasionally they did run into each other and Lawrence was aware of the role that Shoshana was playing in this in the intelligence that they were gathering mm -hmm. so it's partly true partly fiction yeah of course um Kylie oh, we've got a question from Kylie hi Kylie um how long did it take you to research for this book um do you do you also, when you're researching, do you put a time limit on it? I'm adding that to Kylie's question. So how long does it take? You know, like say you spend a year writing a book, is it half the time, all the time? Uh, yeah, it can't be all the time. <laughs> yes. Hi, Kylie. Thanks for your question. And that's a good question. Well, I it actually, is. yeah, very good. It takes sometimes, well, in this case, you, you want to know how long this took. It took about 18 months just mm. to do the research because I had to look up all kinds of books and all historical texts, biographical texts, all sorts of things. And then mm. that took about 18 months. So, and then the, the actual writing after that also took about 18 months, maybe just maybe 15 months. Mm. So, I have okay. a question. Um, Cheryl Arkell. Hello, everybody at home. I'm speaking with Diane Armstrong. Any comments or questions, just feed them through to us and we'd love to answer them. Um, do you sometimes, let's say you've got the story in your head, right, and you've got this particular story, The Wild Date Palm, 
and you're researching, let's say, the siblings, and you, in your research, you discover something that you didn't know that either makes the character more li likeable or maybe more unlikable, or your relationship as a writer with the character is, oh, maybe I don't like that person anymore. Does, does that happen in the way that you approach it? Because I guess you're discovering you've got these um, real people from the past would, you know, you're trying to be as true as possible to them, I guess. But does your opinion of them come into play? I guess it does. Well, I guess if I didn't like them, I don't think I'd have been writing the, their mm. story. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah. Second, some I admired more than others. Shoshana was an amazing character. She was incredibly honourable and courageous, and but she wasn't perfect. She had her foibles. I don't like perfect people. I don't know any, and I I just don't think anyone is perfect. So I don't sort of describe perfect people. But I, I really admired her for what she did because she started off as a person who was envious of her brother who had an aim in life, had a purpose in life. She didn't feel she had a purpose in life. And she also envied Lawrence when she met him because he was so sure of himself. He said, I'm going to write my will among the stars. Well, well, like, you know, she thought this, this is fantastic. Why can't I feel like that? Why don't I have something that makes me feel that I've got such a, an important mission in life? Eventually she does by accident discover her mission. And, and so I was totally, I mean, she challenged the might of the Ottoman Empire, basically. This young woman in a little backwater town, she challenges this mighty Ottoman Empire. So I was I was in. That was amazing. Then then there's her lover, who's very charismatic. Now he was a bit problematic because like a lot of very volatile, charismatic people. He was rather self-absorbed and maybe even a bit selfish. So, but the thing is, while I'm writing, I try and see things from the character's point of view. And and so it, it's interesting because someone said to me today, I've read the book and I love all the characters, but he, I found him a bit of a problem. And I thought, well, that's good. That's right. Because in life, some people are a problem. And... Mm -hmm and he's one of them, but I write it when I'm writing about him or anyone, I'm writing it from their point of view. So that's where I am. And as for your question about do I find out something I didn't know, when I started, I didn't know anything about any of them, so that everything I found out was new and exciting and fantastic. And some of the things I found out I used in the book, in the, novel and some I didn't find important enough or I didn't feel they propelled the story because I'm, I'm basically a storyteller and I like us to propel the story along I don't like it to sort of go into side paths and mm. that's, so that's really what happens I just use what I think is going to push the story along and I try and discard what doesn't. Mm. Um, why do you think, I mean, historical fiction, Diane, is such a big genre and I know a lot of our readers and, and they'll all confirm this out there, they love historical fiction and I think the fact that it is fiction um, is, is something that they like about it but they want it to be authentic historically as well. I think that's important to a reader. Um, and you guys can tell me if this is true or not, but I, I think that that's it for me while I'm reading. Um, do you think that the interest is in the past that we're bringing to now? Do you think why do you think it is we love historical fiction so much? Well, I think we like stories, and mm. the past is a story. It's a it's more complete of a story than anything that's happening now that mm. we're involved in so we're looking at the past but at the same time we're recognizing the fact that the things that we're reading about that happened in the past the universal truths emerge the mm. way people behave 
doesn't change. Doesn't matter whether it's the unfortunately, or... Diane. It doesn't change. We don't exactly. seem to learn from history enough. No, I mean, look at this. Not. Look at the mess the world is in at the moment. You know, absolutely. and you absolutely. think, how could this happen? Knowing what we know, you know, maybe we should read more historical fiction. <laughs> maybe we should. <laughs> Listen, I want to hear from people at home. Why is it that you read? historical fiction what is it that you love about it and you know there might be some of you at home that don't like historical fiction so let me know um i've got a question from kylie again she and this is an interesting question do you have any input into the final cover of your book oh kylie you ask such good questions um yes i do i've got a wonderful publisher and when they give the graphic designer the book and she comes up with something they immediately send it to me to mm -hmm. okay or not now this cover i okayed immediately it mm -hmm. hasn't always been like that in the past in the past sometimes i've had a couple of goes at it but i really appreciate the fact that they give me the say that i can say yes i love it or i don't think it really suits the story or whatever so. and also I think you know when you're looking up at a cover and great question Kylie when you're looking at the cover it has to tell you something about the book you know you have to know it has to give away something um and or it, yes or it has to intrigue you exactly it yeah yeah exactly um uh so um we've got uh, lots of hellos diane so i won't go through all of those um and lots, lots of welcome back cheryl um oh josephine says josephine bryant hi josephine that she loves um the character shoshiana how close to the historical character is she in the wild day palm very close um I, she she's actually the reason why i wrote the book because I was so in love with the character that I read about. So she's very close. Obviously, I wasn't there. I didn't hear her. I didn't see her making love with Eli. I didn't hear her arguments with her sister or her mother. So all these things, I hope that I stayed true to the character. But basically, from the beginning to the end, it's basically very true to the character as she really was. Mm. Thanks, Josephine. Yeah, thanks, Josephine. Um, we've got another question here from, um, oh, it's Melissa saying, I find history fascinating. I often get to the end and I'm amazed that what I have read is true. The past helps us to explain how we have got to where we are today. That's, That's really amazing. lovely. Yeah, but actually coming back to the history I love history, I always have, and I love discovering more, delving deeper and deeper, but I'm very mindful when I'm writing that I'm not writing a history book. And mm -hmm. so even though it's historical fiction, I try and keep the history to a minimum, only what's needed for the story. I don't want people to feel that they're reading a lecture on history, that they're getting bogged down in something. So mm -hmm. have to sort of keep a balance between explaining things to people so that it makes sense to them, things that they may not know. I mean, not many people know very much about the Ottoman Empire, you know, so I certainly didn't. Mm. So I try and keep that in mind. Mm. I'm often, I don't know if you do this, and I don't know if, you, you know, some of our readers at home do this, but if I'm reading something, and I get to something I don't know enough about, I'll jump out of the book for a bit, I'll Google, I'll do a little bit of research <laughs> and I'll come back because sometimes that gives me the context that I need to, to enjoy the story further. I wonder if anyone else does that. Do you do that? Um, yes, sometimes I do. Yeah. Sometimes I do. You know, I, I think you have to be very careful when you're writing historical fiction to make sure that all the facts are correct. 
Mm. Um, oh, I think that that's so true, Diane. And even I, I really do think that readers are discerning and mm. they want an authentic experience. You know, Absolutely. they want a great story. Of course, they do. Uh, but if you're if you're saying that it's historical fiction, the historical um, element needs to be correct, all as yeah. correct as it can be. Of course, because readers are very quick to find something that mm -hmm. isn't exactly right. For instance, in my previous book one writer picked up the fact that I had someone, a young, this was in Dancing with the Enemy, which is set in on the island of Jersey during the German occupation. This is World War II. And again, this is something that I didn't really know that Jersey was occupied by the Germans almost the entire war. Mm. And uh, I had a young man from Jersey, young fellow, teenager, wanted to escape and he was captured. And at some point he grabs a, a, a gun and someone wrote to me and said that that gun that you wrote on page 322 that that's an anachronism they didn't have those kind of guns though the germans wouldn't have had those guns so and he corrected me that it should be that kind of gun and not this gun so yeah yeah no i can see that you know people um, are very careful and very discerning <laughs> They are. All right, we're almost out of time. Um, Kylie says they take you to a different world, historical fiction. They take you to a different world full of great stories and visions. They do indeed. Um, Melissa said she doesn't do that while reading. Cheryl, um, jump out and jump in. Um, but I have done that after I have read a book afterwards. Yeah, there you go. Sometimes you just need some clarifications, <laughs> some clarification. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Josephine says that she does that too. She jumps in and out, checks something if she doesn't know about it, and is also a bit obsessed with finding old maps and working out where the action took place. So that's Josephine. Okay, well, that's it for us. We're out of time, lovely Diane. Um, always so good to chat with you. you uh, Diane is out and about. She's touring a little bit, aren't you? Um, yes. And if you want to find out what's your visit, uh, Diane's website, where where do people go to find out where you're going to be, Diane? Um, well, the website is www.dianearmstrong.com. So oh, there you go. And we will link that um, here for you in the comments if you'd like to know. Uh, the new book is called uh, The Wild Date Palm. Diane Armstrong, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for your wonderful questions. And thank